Welcome back to another edition of Between Two Fars. I'm Warnicky Miller, and today I have the pleasure of being joined by the poster children for MAP. Yes, that's right. As we're moving to an enterprise-wide litigation system, these are our two guinea pigs. We had a wonderful cooperation coming out of two separate NASA centers when Dave Schumann and Paul Kim were asked to work together as Dave's lengthy ASBCA case was barreling towards hearing. And we're here today to hear a little bit about their lessons learned. We're going to specifically focus on subpoenas and what it takes to get a subpoena issued in an ASBCA case, as well as some important practice tips and maybe some pointers to avoid some pitfalls. Welcome, guys. I am so glad that you could join us today on Between Two Fars. Um, let's open it up very broadly. Paul, can you tell us a little bit about just some basic resources that the new practitioner could use if they're jumping into some ASBCA litigation and, and need to figure out what to, to do with a subpoena? Yeah, yeah. so um, uh, I came from a litigation background and uh, working in the private sector and a resource that was available at every firm I worked at was called the Rudder Group. And they publish uh, literally step-by-step uh, books that walk you through every stage of litigation and uh, the procedural aspects of litigation, which are often the most confusing. They're not difficult once you learn how to do them. It doesn't take rocket science. You're not asked to learn, you know, calculus, but they are rules that if you haven't experienced them before, um, they're not intuitive. But the rudder guide is, it, it, it cuts through the chase and it provides you literally step-by-step -step guidance and they often provide checklists for various phases of the litigation and if i can share my screen please do. Uh, when i when i joined this case i was happy to find out that our the firm subscription to westlaw includes uh, a full suite of rudder guide um resources and it just looks like a link but if you have these in paper format and, and they come in binders, it's mm -hmm. it's a quite uh, comprehensive set of instruction. And I saw here, well, this is specific to the Ninth Circuit, but they have one that's uh, more broad. Federal civil procedure before trial, you know, federal civil and trials and evidence. Um, and they also have things on motions in limine and even step-by-step -step guidance for uh, summary judgment, but um, this is found under secondary sources. If you just type in the rudder group, you'll get uh, practice guides for many areas of practice. The ASPCA doesn't follow the set of federal rules of civil procedure to a T, but my experience in this instant ASPCA litigation is that they, they generally follow it and they take arguments from uh, official civil rules when we had to argue things like uh, privilege and rules of evidence. So uh, they don't follow it strictly, but it certainly has a lot of, uh, what I would say, they give it a lot of weight and it's never bad guidance to follow it. So here it is on the screen. That, that is an excellent practice tip and a good place to get started. Let's focus a little bit down into the weeds on subpoenas. Can you give us sort of an overview on the practice of issuing subpoenas. Is it better to run right to the ASBCA and ask for subpoenas or to try to secure voluntary cooperation? What would you recommend? Yeah, so quickly, subpoena is whenever you need to get information um, or compel uh, a party to do something in the case that's not a named party to the lawsuit. So an employee that no longer works for the company or a third party entity that is not a named party, that's when you issue a subpoena. But um, instead of diving directly into how to formally issue a subpoena or requesting a subpoena, um, it's best practices to contact the opposing counsel or to uh, handle things informally and do as much work as you can informally. A lot of the times, um, even though they're not official parties to the case, uh, opposing counsel will um, be in contact with say like a major sub or former employee and will have some level of control and access to that person. And 
Um, the boards like to see the parties cooperate and often uh, they'll ask <laughs> and they did in this case, I believe, right, Dave, they, they asked, um, well, did you ask opposing counsel if they could arrange this? And so um, instead of uh, going through the rigmarole of official formal subpoena service, uh, just give opposing counsel a call, keep things professional. Uh, that, that's another reason why you want to keep things professional um, and uh, not hold them to uh, unnecessary procedures. If you can work with them and build a good rapport with procedural things, then you can ask them, hey, I need a subpoena, a major sub. We know you're in constant contact with them. Could you just help us out here? That's interesting with the subs. What if they say subcontractor, they're not a part of this case. I can't control them. Well, how would you respond? Yeah, and so we dealt with this in, in our particular case. This was very much a case that was pursued by the subcontractor. Uh, formally, it was a litigation between us and the prime contractor. But um, as Dave might tell you, it was really controlled by the subcontractor and it was a pass through claim. Um, and so when we had issues with the opposing counsel playing hardball and saying, hey, I can't I can't help you with discovery against the subcontractor. They're not a party to this case. You're going to have to do everything on your own. And the the board said um, and don't quote me, but she she indicated that it is ASPCA policy that where there's a pass through claim, they impute control. They, they consider that the prime contractor who is the named party has control over the subcontractor. And once the judge said that, um, the opposing counsel stopped playing hardball because no one wants to upset the judge and said, OK, yeah, we, we will cooperate. We will produce some of the subcontractor employees without the need of a subpoena. So, yeah. Now, no, that's that's a wonderful practice tip. If you run into some resistance, you can let them know that the ASPCA will probably imply that you're able to control the subs, especially with the pass through claim. Um, Dave, right. can you help us understand a little bit about the mechanics of actually wanting to get a subpoena issued? Let's say they're playing hardball or you're not able to get a hold of this witness without a subpoena. What does the practitioner have to do to actually go in front of the ASBCA and correctly get a subpoena issued. Sure, and and I would be, I'm happy to answer that and then I would be remiss if I didn't give 30 seconds on um, first of all uh, thanking you Warnicky, for putting these together. I think they're going to be very helpful for people facing these issues the first time. And second, uh, just to note uh, how pleased I am to be able to give back a little uh, feeling almost uh, coming full circle since uh, Bob Tepfer at JSC gave me lots of tips and advice on my first ASBCA case uh, 20 years ago. So um, happy to participate and to dive right into the very specific subject. So we learned this really the hard and inefficient way that um, first of all, you can request subpoenas from the board. Um, it's a pretty straightforward process. You do have to copy opposing counsel when you do that because it is uh, you don't want to be considered having ex part communications with the board. So I had initially thought, well, when we get the subpoenas, of course, I'll serve opposing counsel and notify them then. But the board very politely um, set me straight on that. You do have to copy opposing counsel on the request. Uh, with respect to the form, there turns out to be three different kinds of subpoenas that are available from the board, and they're um, available by drop-down menu, at least at, at present time on the board's website. You can request a subpoena for testimony, a uh, subpoena do just take them, bring with you documents, or just a subpoena for the documents alone. And so it's important to know what exactly you're asking for. And uh, as part of that process, it, it's important to note that uh, just because you do obtain the subpoena doesn't mean you actually have to go through with it. And even if you do go through with it, uh, you may wind up having um, uh, having it withdrawn because as Paul touched on, the most efficient way to get what you need, the testimony or the documents, is to have voluntary cooperation. So having that general subject of subpoena um, out there in professional discussions with opposing counsel uh, tends to make opposing counsel come to reason a bit um, more quickly um, in most cases. So it's a useful tool. Um, let me stop there and uh, happy to follow up on any details. Yeah, well, let's kind of throw it out to both of you now. 
you've got your subpoena. You're not done though. You've got to serve this thing, right? So what are your lessons learned about actually the process of trying to serve a subpoena on an individual? Yes, uh, I guess I'll follow up on that. So uh, again, we learned in somewhat inefficient fashion uh, and we had a, a logistically difficult case. Um, hopefully not all cases are like this, but our witnesses were spread out um, literally in four different time zones in multiple states across the country. So our first course was to hire a national service or process firm that had been recommended. Um, they were unsuccessful in at least one instance in serving the subpoena. We tried again. They were unsuccessful. We hired another national firm. They were unsuccessful. Eventually, uh, we came to realize that hiring an extremely local firm is the most efficient and quickest way to get service or process. Um, this is what the national firms do anyway. They subcontract out to local providers. The local providers are more familiar with the service territory. They can get to the service um, much quicker and we were very successful. And I'll just say by anecdote in uh, contacting the local process server in Anchorage, Alaska, to make service of process in Wasilla, wonderful town about half hour north of Anchorage, I've actually driven through. The process server was so happy to get a call from NASA uh, because as he said, uh, now I can tell all my friends I'm working for NASA. So you never know what you're going to get, um, but local is good, at least in, in our experience and, and more efficient. Uh, you may have to do some research to find out um, where your witness is located. In many cases, count, opposing counsel may not give you that information. The clients may have some hint in our situation. Uh, my client spent um, a few hours running this down through existing records uh, and we eventually got to the right service or process address but in one case we had two addresses to serve and uh, we weren't quite sure but the process server can help with that um, but it's not always the easiest thing in the world uh, but eventually you can get your subpoena served then there are particular rules on who can accept service or process say your subject isn't home you know can a spouse accept service or process uh, but this is, you know, what you pay the process server for, and uh, you never know, you might have a wonderful experience contacting the local process server like we did. That's uh -huh. terrific. Any, anything else to add, Paul? Yeah, some, some tips that, um, uh, and these came up in our case, is when you're serving a corporation, and I don't just mean a comma INC, any type of business entity, um, most states require um, entities with tax consequences to register with the the state's secretary, um, uh, the secretary of the state. So, um, and part of that registration process is you're supposed you're required by law. In I can't speak for most states, but I haven't seen a state where it's not applied. I just haven't gone through every fifty state <laughs> states. But uh, you're required to register your agent for service of process. And it's a two-way street. Like if you, if you as the attorney just serve their mailing address, which is not their registered agent, agent service of process, if they're if they're one of these stickler for rules, they can say your service was defective, even though they have it in their hands, um, because hey, I'm a I'm a I'm a a, a legal entity. My address for service is public knowledge and you didn't serve me pursuant to my agent of service of process. So uh, most secretary uh, of state websites, they have a business entity search for that reason. And you you type in the entity name, you might have to see how sensitive their, their search parameters are, but most of them are pretty good. And then you'll get a list of names, you click on it. And one of the first things that typically pops up is, it'll say agent for service of process or service service um, address mm -hmm. and that's who you want to serve um, in order to affect perfect service most people <laughs> especially if, you, if you're already communicating with them they'll accept service and and so it's not an issue but you know depending on how much of a stickler for rules that either the judge is or the other attorney um, that could something that could be something that destroys uh, the validity of your service the other last tip um, and I'll keep it at two seconds, is um, you, know, you not only have to serve subpoenas for the, the discovery phase, but the same person or entity you served a subpoena with for discovery, that doesn't mean they're going to automatically show up to the trial for the hearing. You have to issue another subpoena 
for their parents at the hearing as well to testify. And so um, uh, we caught that early enough. <laughs> it was something I should have been advising Dave of it, but you know, I'm not perfect either. And, and so, but luckily we, we, I remembered, oh yeah, we have to issue the subpoenas again. And uh, luckily it came to my memory with sufficient time, but that could have been a huge oops. <laughs> oh, that's wonderful. Guys, thank you so much for your time today. These, This has been a wealth of practice tips from our very own dynamic duo of subpoenas. Thank you very much, Paul and Dave. And I can't wait for them to come back again next time when we're going to talk about privilege logs. We'll see you all again on the next Between Two Fars.